Welcome to tonight's Tuesday night broadcast. We are going to be completely transparent here. We are having some major technical difficulties, but I have my amazing investment partners with me here, Stephanie Sieber, Dana Burrell. Craig is in the background, the amazing Craig, the illustrious Craig. He'll be answering questions on the chat. We will not be having yes. a formal presentation tonight. This discussion tonight is going to be totally up to you guys to ask questions in the chat. Throw them out there. We are here at your disposal. We are all active investors. So before we kick this thing off, before we start answering questions, let's just go around the room really quick and let's talk about where we're from, what we're doing, what our experience has been in real estate. So let's let's kick it off with Steph. Steph, give us a little bit of uh, background on you. Hi, guys. Yeah, my name is Stephanie Siebert. And uh, as you can see, just popped into the, the screen. Um, I work with these two lovely ladies, uh, Jenny and Dana. Um, we started coaching with connected investors um, a year ago, which is how we got connected. Um, and now we also coach with investment angels. Um, so I, I coach real estate. That's one of the things I do, um, which is why we're perfect candidates to be giving you guys information about PING tonight and how to use it for your real estate investing career. Outside of coaching, um, I am an actual real estate investor. So I own a company that wholesales real estate. Um, so I, I operate in Florida and Colorado. I own a brokerage in Colorado. I'm licensed in New York. I have short-term and long-term rentals uh, and I fix and flip properties. So uh, I've kind of done it all. And I've actually, recently I just did a little transactional lending to help these two ladies uh, out. So yeah, very experienced in all the different facets of real estate. I'll pass it to you, Dana. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So I am Dana Burrell and I am, I was gonna say stationed in um, Charlotte, North Carolina. Yes, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I got my start in real estate um, in 2020 and have been rocking and rolling as a wholesaler, but I have moved into hel um, helping out with some fix and flips. Um, I lend money. I'm also um, in the buy and hold field now, which I absolutely love and doing some sub twos. Right now I'm working on two as we speak right here in North Carolina. Um, I primarily work right in my own backyard, which I love because it's familiar to me. And um, I also am a coach with Connected Investors. And like Stephanie said, we just started Investment Angels, uh, which we absolutely love doing. We love giving back to the members of Connected Investors and outside of Connected Investors as well. And so that is our latest and newest venture, uh, working on a few deals with Jenny and um, look forward to working on some deals with Stephanie as well. So that's what I'm doing today. What about I love you? It. Love it. So I just want to make sure that everybody can hear us. We're getting some different yes. comments in the chat, um, but this is great. You will not be able to actually converse with us, but that is what your question or your chat uh, box is for. Well, so I, please put any questions in there and that's how we'll communicate back and forth. So really quick to give you background on me. I am originally from Utah. My husband and I together in our business, we fix and flip across the entire United States as well as Mexico, which is actually where I'm currently at uh, this week, is spending some time in Mexico. Um, so if anybody's interested in international investing, that is kind of my, my baby as well. Um, but it's cool, we all deploy every single exit strategy, right? You've got your three main exit strategies, you've got wholesaling, you've got fix and flip, you've got buy and hold. And there's a lot of caveats around all of those. We can be creative around all of those, but really, in essence, those are your three main exit strategies. So we are here tonight as active real estate investors. We're coaches, we're mentors. We all own investment angels together. This is what we do on the daily. So really, the floor is yours as members of Connected Investors. If you're not members, subscribe to Connected Investors. I believe they have a 50% off deal going right now, a seven-day free trial. The data is phenomenal. Um, but with that, yeah, it's really the, the time is yours. So my co-host, Stephanie oh, Dana, chime in. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a first question, which I think is really great. And it kind of kicks us off here, right? So obviously the front, you know, this is called Connected Investors, right? This is why you're all here. And our first question here comes from um, Jesse Malaris. Um, sorry if I mess up y'all's name. Uh, I am new to CI. 
can you show how we connect with others like yourself in order to discuss deals? Fantastic question. Absolutely. So I love this. I think this is kind of um, an underutilized part of PIN. Um, and, and so you can go into the software um, and actually open up, um, you can go search for people essentially. Um, so it's in the community, area. which is at the top left of your screen. So you can actually connect with people on whether you're subscribed or not, which is really neat. So you go into community at the top left and you can go into members and you can search our names. Um, so you can search our names, you can search areas of interest, um, and you can friend people on, on the platform. So if you search uh, Jenny Nelson, Eudania Burrell, or Stephanie Siebert, you'll actually find us and connect with us. Um, I know Jay, uh, Jay shout out if you're here, he connected with us recently um, from these acceleration sessions. So we are accessible and you guys are accessible to each other. Um, so it's a really neat part of PIN. Dana, did you have anything to add? Yes, yeah, so I wanna add to that. Um, when you do go into the community, you can search by members. You can also search your own area by those who are doing fix and flip, who are wholesaling, who are agents. So you can find anyone who is a part of the community and just go ahead and friend them. And I would highly advise, get in there, start friending people, especially us, we wanna hear from you. And so you wanna get in there, that is so um, key to connecting with other investors within Connected Investors. I love it. I know Charlie uh, Charlie Fulton's got a couple of questions here. The first one is, and maybe Seth, this is best directed to you. How do you work with a real estate agent on a property you want to buy wholesale? Love it. Great, great question. Fantastic. Yeah, so a majority of my deals come um, from real estate um, investors, and, real estate investors. Actually, agents are sometimes often real estate investors, as evidenced by both Jenny and myself. Um, <laughs> but you uh, are going to reach out and basically what we typically do is we take the seat of an investor, right? So if you're a wholesaler, you're also an investor, you're making money from real estate, that's an investment strategy, right? So when you talk to the agent, um, you would just talk as if you were a regular buyer and you're talking about different exit strategies, right? So your exit strategies are um, a myriad of different ways, but usually what we say is we're looking for fix and flips. So I'm looking for properties in fair to poor condition that I can go in, add value to, and um, sell it a, a, for a profit. So that's typically how we approach real estate agents. Um, we do like to give specificity, maybe a little bit more about certain areas we're looking at or certain price points. So for instance, in wholesaling, you typically are looking for properties that are in that um, entry level. So whatever that market price point is for you, whatever the entry level uh, prices, that's what we'll, we'll guide them on. But the best thing to do when you're reaching out to agents is making sure that you're just guiding them on what you're looking for. And ultimately you're guiding them to what your end buyer is looking for. So if you don't know, go connect with some end buyers, ask them what their buy boxes are, and then parrot what they say back to the real estate agent. Because ultimately you are looking for that and then you're just adding a little bit um, of a buffer in there for yourself. So if you wanna make 10 grand, you wanna make 15 grand, you want 20, I literally just closed a deal for 45 grand last week. You can be like that, you can do that. So just make sure you're filtering uh, or adding that fee in for you when you're speaking to them, so. I love it. All right. Love it, that Good was great. Response. Charlie had a third question. Do you always have to put money down to get the buyer into a contract? And the answer to that question is actually yes. You do need to have yes. some form of consideration. I don't care that, but it could be $1 <laughs> literally. Um, it's right. typically a little bit more than that. Like, let's be honest, like it, you're typically looking at usually, you know, anywhere between five to 10% of that transaction. So, and it just depends on the property. It depends on the particular seller. How savvy are they to real estate? You can absolutely do a $1 consideration, but it's gotta be some Something of monetary value. So the, the very easy answer to that question uh, uh, is to basically put some sort of consideration down on that particular property. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, I like this at? one right here. This yeah. is Daniel Pendleton. And I'm sorry, I'm just kind of free form all over with the questions. <laughs> Are you so answering Daniel them in order? <laughs> okay. Um, he said, Dana and Stephanie, member here, I know you were both hyper-focused on wholesale as one segment of your business portfolio. I've been using PIN to get some leads for mailers, but curious, other than mailers, what are some daily best practices you do to connect with motivated sellers? I just don't seem to be getting a strong ROI on mailers. And actually, 
you know, I'll, I'll give my two cents and then pass it over to Dana, right? Because we have different approaches. But um, mailers, after spending the past year really going through and trying to figure out what is the highest return on investment, right? I've noticed that mailers um, actually, you know, uh, it was a slow trickle. So I didn't have any consistency with mailers, which was frustrating, especially because getting deals from agents is very consistent. So 95% of my business comes from getting leads from agents. But as I went to diversify my portfolio with direct to seller, um, there's two kind of main ways that you do it um, if you're trying to scale. So one would be mailing like you're trying and the other would be cold calling, whether it's yourself or a virtual assistant cold calling. Um, You could, you know, obviously you can um, not drive for dollars, but you could do like actually not on their door that's another way to get in contact um again not very scalable so from my experience mailers although not consistent were definitely the best return on investment um i made 75 grand off mailers last year and i think i spent 7500 dollars on the mailers um so you know i mean a 10 to 1 return is pretty amazing but it was a, a test of patience it was not something that happened fast. It was not consistent either. So that was something that was, um, I think, hard from a scalability. I think you'd have to really be sending a ton of mailers to get it to a consistency level that would be a full-time job. Um, but again, 75 grand is not a bad, I mean, that is a full-time job. So, I, you know. To, that is, <laughs> if you look that absolutely at it is, so for not, 7,500. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. For 7,500. So I know that's not a great answer, but I have actually explored what you're going through extensively over the past year and just did away with VAs because I was just didn't see that that return on my investment was actually much lower uh, than the mailers. That's Dana, fantastic. Do you have anything to add to that? But just to add to what Stephanie was saying, um, I, I do a lot of mailers, um, not at the scale Stephanie does, but I'm very consistent with it. Every week we have mailers going out. So therefore we have leads coming back in. Do we convert all of them? Absolutely not. They may not be ready today, but we consistently send out those postcards. I also do agent outreach like Stephanie. Um, that's a part of our business today. And we also make phone calls from time to time. We, um, um, I'm sorry, we, choose a specific day of the week that we'll make phone calls. And so we're doing an array of different things and we're consistent with it. So on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays is the agent outreach. On Thursdays, our mailers go out. On Mondays, we're making phone calls. So we're consistently marking and that's what you wanna do. And give yourself some time. Um, I, I know Stephanie in her business, she lets her people know, give it at least three months before you start seeing some traction. And so be patient with yourself. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And so as long as you're being consistent, I believe you will um, begin to see some of the results you're looking for. No, that's fantastic. I know Nora, you asked a question and I actually can't see all of the responses no. in here. So Nora, really quick, I know you had some interest in Mexico. Please feel free to re reach out to any one of us independently. So it's Jenny Nelson. Um, I am in the Connected Investors community. I'm more than happy to talk through any type of investment um, ideas, questions, concerns that you possibly have, as are any of us. Um, and then at Investment Angels, theinvestmentangels.com, you guys you know, can reach out to us all together. Um, and we're more than happy to kind of talk through, you know, any questions that you guys have with real estate investing, because it's a little bit daunting, whether you're a novice or whether you're experienced. Um, we've kind of been there. We've done that. Have we all gone through hurdles, trials, tribulations? Ooh. You better believe it. So if we can help you mitigate any potential pitfalls um, that you might potentially come across um, with investment, we are, we are here to honestly lend a helping hand. So, um Thank you for I that, like Jan. Of course. Yeah, definitely. So how about this? I love this. This is a pin-focused question. Uh, can we use pin to find end buyers? So just so you, for those that don't know, um, uh, an end buyer is going to be someone that's the actual fix and flipper or the buy and holder on in a um, wholesale transaction. So there's um, the seller, the wholesaler that's kind of in the middle, and then there's the end buyer. That's what the end buyer is. And the neat thing about this is Absolutely, you can use PIN to find end buyers. Um, and I will, I'm not gonna name any names of competitors, but this is an extremely expensive service. 
um, that other um, competing tech um, gives and, and PIN just includes it in their software, which I think is miraculous, it's amazing. Yes. So if you go into the advanced search um, on PIN, so it's gonna be at the top of your screen to the far right, it says advanced. You're gonna go into advanced search um, and then you're actually gonna tab over, I think it's the attributes that I have to pull it up exactly, but you can actually search um, by flippers um, and landlords. So that's, uh, and, and look within a certain radius. So you can actually set on pin, set a radius. So you could put an address in and then say, I'm looking anywhere 10 miles around this address and I'm looking for flippers and landlords. Again, this is gonna be in the advanced search part of the software. So it's the top of your screen, advanced, click that. And then you tab over, I believe to attributes and it's there. Um, and so if you search on that, um, it's, it'll pull up a bunch of flippers, a bunch of landlords. Again, you do have to go through that um, and, and check, but there's little, a little piece on the property card itself that actually outlines what that person bought the property for and what they sold it for. So you can truly see um, when they bought it, how much they bought it for, what was their spread on it. Um, it's, it's really phenomenal data. Dana, did you have to yeah. add? Um, Steph, that was um, awesome. Also in the easy mode, if you go onto the map view in the research tool, as you, you know, um, magnify in closer to the map, you will be able to then look at the flips in that area and or the recent sold properties. And so those flips are other investors who flip those properties. And as you, as you hover over each one of them, it will tell you, you click on, it will do the same thing um, as in the advanced mode. Um, also in the community, as you are friending people, now I know some of you are just getting started, but as you begin to friend people, you'll find out who some of these buyers are and you can connect with them. You definitely wanna connect with us because we buy properties. And so, um, yeah, those are just some of the ways that you can find your end buyers. Love it. Joan Lee oh, asked a question. Really yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. It may, and maybe it's the same one, Steph. Can we use PIN to that? find buyers? It is. Yes. <laughs> absolutely can use PIN to find end buyers. So the way that you're going to do that is go into the advanced mode. So when you're looking at your top toolbar, when you first get into PIN on the homepage, you're in easy mode. So for those of you that aren't familiar, you're going to want to click on the icon that says advanced. Once you go into advanced, you need to select a location. I don't care whether it's a zip code, a county, a city, a property. You can do a radius search, but you have to put some sort of location in there. And once you've done that, you can toggle over to the next tab and you can actually click on landlords and flippers. What I recommend is you click on only those two. I believe it also gives you short-term rental yeah. option. But what I personally do is the landlord and flippers and then hit your search button and it is going to give you a search and it's going to basically pull in all of the different investors in that particular area zip code county whatever radius you put in for your location and it's going to give you like tens to hundreds to potentially thousands of invest investors locally in that area so what pin has done is it's aggregated data data that you can now take and you can reach out to them directly you can call them you can text them you can send them a postcard i don't care what your marketing form is but you have end buyers at your disposal with pins data it is right there so hopefully that answered your question take a minute to play around inside pin we apologize that we can't give you real-time um, presentations of how how to utilize that um, but it is there for you if you have questions again reach out to any of us independently we're more than happy to walk you through that also uh, so uh, paris jones asked when prospecting leads for wholesale which motivations work best for you so uh, PIN has a ton of features, right? It can really do a lot of things, especially for the novice real estate investor. It's a great way to run calculators, et cetera. And one of the biggest things though, is that it provides leads and it provides really fantastic motivations, right? And broken down by motivation. So what this, um, what Paris is asking us is what motivations, right? Um, propel a seller to actually sell. And that is what PIN is. It's an amazing tool to find motivated sellers. It aggregates a, ben a bunch of data points and tells you that this person is possibly more likely to sell. So um, there's a bunch of different, um, motivations that you can control for on PIN, but I think that we can all agree here that there's some major ones and 
sneak peek, you're going to see this on the reboot of CI or PIN uh, as they start to rework it. So it's going to be a little bit more clear. But so pre foreclosure, that's going to be one of your major motivations. Uh, you've got probate as a major motivation, uh, aka a death. Um, a pre foreclosure, and then you've got vacant absentee owner. So that's going to be um, a property that's sitting vacant um, and that it's just costing someone money. So if you think kind of about a pyramid, those are kind of going to be at the top, right? Those are your major motivations. And then other items that you can also search for on PIN, like tax liens, mechanics liens, um, et cetera, those are kind of going to be layered on. So that would further entice someone to sell a property, um, but your majors are going to be the probate, the pre-foreclosure, the vacant absentee owner. Uh, my bread and butter is probate. I saw someone asking about probate in the uh, questions here. Not really sure how it relates to South Carolina, but they were both in the same question. So yes, we know about probates. So we can touch on them, um, but those are your major motivations um, that PIN can help you with and serve by. Dana, what's your major motivation? What do you, what do you like to focus on? I love to focus on the vacant absentee owners. And so just like Stephanie said, you can go in and just play around with it, choose some motivations and see what comes up in whatever area you're looking to market in. Love it. And I have to I have to tell you, my 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 jam, my baby, my sweet spot is pre foreclosures <laughs> and auctions. Love them, love yeah. them. Um, I will all day long market to pre foreclosures, but you better believe I'm cruising auction properties as well. But I'm also trying to get a hold of those auction property owners prior to preempt the auction process from even occurring. So I have a strategy that I like to deploy to do that. But if all else fails, I'm also a cash investor and I'm not opposed to just, just picking off a property um, specifically and directly at auction either, which kind of leads us into, you know, the, the money we're talking about, cash and capital. Jesse um, Malaris asked a question, if you're short on cash for earnest money, how would you go about solving that? So first and foremost, the three of us at Investment Angels, we are private money lenders. We also do very short earnest money um, transactions. We do transactional funding. We do what's called gator lending. We do a little bit of everything. We can also do uh, short-term, long-term financing. Um, so we broker all of that. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And if you're looking for long-term financing, you can always go to privatelenders.com as well That's right. um, within Connected Investors, right? It's one of your tabs and your drop-downs in the top left corner. You can go there and you can actually fill out and a bunch of different private lenders will directly reach out to you and ask you questions about your property, what's going on. They'll evaluate the risk associated with that property. So you have a myriad of different resources for financing. Um, so hopefully that was that was a very short list, but you, you have access to a lot of different funding. The three of us here all do it. Um, private lenders does it. Um, great question. What would you say to a, re this is Charlie again, what would you say to a real estate agent to let them know that you only want to put $10 in this consideration? What if I, what if they say, no, it has to be 10%, uh, what's, thanks so much. Um, and I will say, um, while you can put in a very small amount of consideration to have a binding contract, if you are working with a real estate professional, um, you're probably going to be uh, following the practices of whatever is in that area. So if the practice in your area is 10% as earnest money, you better believe they're going to want 10% for earnest money. The only reason that they would um, possibly tell their client to accept your offer of $10 for earnest or your offer, yeah, with uh, $10 earnest money is if it had been sitting for months and months and months and you were the only offer on the table, then they have no negotiation power. Uh, and they can still re reject it, and you are still going to have a hurdle because um, the seller might believe that it's not about it's not valid. So if you can muster up even a thousand dollars, again, That's depending right. on your area. So if you're in um, upstate New York, uh, that won't work. I mean, you need ten percent, <laughs> and people aren't going to accept it. May work in North Carolina though. <laughs> <laughs> but it might work in North Carolina. That's yeah, right. So it really depends on the market and where you are and what the the going what what's normal in that area, and then also the competition. How many people are you up against? And also, like Steph said, it depends on the property. It depends on the type of relationship you've built with the realtor and what um, they understand you doing. Um, and so I, I know for me, I always build relationships with the realtors, I'm agents, excuse me, I'm working with. And so I may not be putting up earnest money of that high. 
Um, it may be a hundred, but they understand what it is I'm doing because I've established a relationship with them. And so, you know, that may be something you can look at doing. But when you're first starting out, like Stephanie said, you know, uh, depending on the area you're in, you may be required to put up 10%. So you want to look at all of that. Awesome. So Moses, uh, I like this one from Jen. Oh, sorry. He said something about an agent cannot refuse to ask the seller. And Moses, you were spot on. As a real estate agent, I am a licensed real estate agent. We have a fiduciary and ethical responsibility to propose any type of offer or proposal to our sellers. That is part of our responsibility. That's part of our exclusive right to sell agreement that we embark upon, that we have signed, that our client has signed. So you are absolutely right, Moses. We do need to basically present that. And at that point, obviously, as an agent, I would guide them and say, oh my gosh, 10 bucks is ridiculous. Maybe we should rethink that. We need to have a little bit more skin in the game. So it just depends, but yes, you are right. They should be disclosing that. They should be presenting that to their seller um, at the end of the day. Exactly. I like this one from, um, let's see, Haji. Um, can I use PIN to calculate ARV? So this is oh. awesome. Oh, yes, they do. They absolutely actually calculate it for you. So when you're on the property card, you can pull up the property calculator or you can actually pull up a, um, um, like a rehab calculator essentially, or an assignment um, to find out an assignment fee on the, on the property card itself, which is if you're in PIN and you click on a property, right? It pulls up and it's on the side and it's called the property card. So you have kind of a picture at the top, you have all the information about it. So you can kind of think about it like a, a Zillow card or a realtor.com card, right? So it's similar to that, but on PIN with way more capabilities. So it has that calculator on there for you. If you go down, it actually fills in the ARV and the ARV is coming from what PIN has identified as other recent sales um, that are comparable. So they're called comps, comparables, um, and they're saying that that's the ARV. So it, while I'm always of the opinion that you get second um, opinions, that, that you look at it and you make your own decisions um, by looking at the, um, the numbers, if you have no idea, uh, if you have absolutely no idea what you're doing, it is perfect because it gives you a semblance, even if it's a little bit off, it's going to give you, it might be more exact than you are, right? So it's a phenomenal tool. Um, it's again, located right on that property card. So yes, you can calculate ARV with PIN. Um, and then as you become more skilled, right, then you'll probably use that PIN to start and maybe augment it with other sources too. Love that. So Bruce asked a question um, about, does PIN have the ability to track pre-foreclosures, public records, updates from Liz Pendens to final judgment? And the answer to that is yes to a certain degree. My advice to you, because that is a space that I play in very frequently, is I would always check with the auction sites directly. And even better than that, I would also check with the presiding law firm that is the appointed trustee over that particular property. So these law firms will give you the most up-to-date, timely information. PIN is an amazing first start to get that information, especially if you're just doing a blanket marketing um, right. campaign out to, let's just say, pre-foreclosures. It will give you the ability to see if they're in pre-foreclosure. Are they Liz Pendens? Has the property been dismissed? But from a timing perspective, your best bet for that is to go a step further and go directly to, like I said, the presiding trustee, was, which is typically a local law firm. And you can go to their website and they'll give you the most current information. I personally have shown up to an auction before and to come to find out five minutes before the auction, they were able to um, redeem that property and it's a no go, right? So I have to walk away. So just know that that happens. That is part of the process. That is part of the game. If that's what we want to call what we're actually playing with here. Um, but uh, great information coming from PIN directly, but I, I like to take it a step further as well. All right, to be clear, I'm in a situation with a property in South Carolina. Should I start working with a lawyer? Oh, what's the Teresa, situation? Okay. Teresa asked about the probate. I don't know what the, yeah, the situation is, but if the situation yeah. is the, the death of the owner, then we're talking probate. <laughs> so yeah. um, 
if if the person that owns that is deceased, right, um, and they have, a, I mean, I believe even if they have a will, yes, you should absolutely speak to an estate attorney. Um, they should be able to read the will. They should uh, assign a personal representative um, or an executor for the estate. Um, again, it is state by state. Uh, it, it varies um, state by state what the different rules and regulations are, um, what the process is. But essentially, you're going to get a, a personal representative that's assigned. Um, I don't know all the nuances because I haven't actually gone through the probate process myself personally, but I do know when they're selling real estate, um, they have to have this personal representative assigned. And what the personal representative is, right, is a deceased person can't make decisions. So this person is um, who the deceased person wanted to or that the state um, has chosen in, in lieu of the person having a will um, to make decisions on behalf of the estate. Um, that's why it's important to have a personal representative um, a, assigned to the estate so that they can sign your contract right so again that's a very um you know narrow scope very real estate uh, centric but that's that's what you're looking for but it's also important to note that it does not have to be done with probate right you do not have to be through the entire probate process to sell a that's home right. so you have to have a personal representative who can sign the contract to sell the home the contract can be can be sold or the house can be sold before it goes through probate and i feel that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions about probate um deals Thank you for sharing that, Steph. That was great. Yeah. So Dana, this this next question is good from Kenneth Athman that I think you might be really equipped to handle. So it says, Dana, Steph, and Jenny, when you started in the business of wholesaling, did you start with cold calling until you had first your first contract, and then you did you build up your business from there with a VA and or a partner? So you know, Dana, do you want to, Dana yeah. and or Steph? Do you guys want to handle that one? Yeah, I'll start it off. Um, so yes, when I started, I was cold calling. Uh, because I needed to learn the verbiage. I need to learn the language of real estate. I had no experience whatsoever. And so I used all of the tools that were available to me within Connected Investors. And that's in the, um, what is it, the Resource Center. Um, now, what is the name of that now? The, Success uh, Center. Success Center, yes. And you can find all of your um, your scripts in there. And so I used those scripts when I first started to do my cold calling. Of course, I made it my own and before long, I no longer needed a script. I then started with postcards and I, I've used a VA once or twice, but I, I've had no success with VAs. I also did emails and I've had some success with emails, although you have to send out a lot. The volume is a lot higher with the emails. Um, but I've actually um, gotten some deals under contract with emails. Um, and from there, we started with um, th what Stephanie does with agent outreach. And we've continued to evolve over the years. But my bread and butter is the postcards with consistency. You have to be consistent. All marketing works. You have to be consistent with it. So way <laughs> nope that's great so here's another question that says on mls offers can we put in a clause that a thousand dollar deposit is due upon completion of inspection the beauty of this really you guys everything is up for negotiation all you need that's to do right. is present an offer they can either accept decline or counter offer so to me the sky is the limit and i always ask for the entire moon maybe I get a star. So, right. But I'm going to ask for as much as I possibly can. And they can always come back and either just flat out decline. They have every right to do so, or they can counter offer me. So, um, Billy, the, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Typically earnest money is due in a normal transaction, usually between 24 to 72 hours. Um, once all parties have signed off on that contract, but again, you can build out your contract, however you deem fit and they can choose to accept it. or that. So um, that, that's my personal response to that. How does PIN work in finding pre-MLS properties from Jesse? So pre-MLS, so PIN is again, a lead source, right? So they're aggregating data across many, many different sources, right? Um, like pre-foreclosure, um, probates, et cetera. So they're finding data sources um, that are publicly available. Um, and then they're uh, processing that, and then it's indicating that this is in pre foreclosure because um, the uh, NED has been filed, et cetera, right? So that is 
sometimes a pre MLS, sometimes not, but you can actually filter on pin and you can ask for properties that are not listed on the MLS. You can filter for expired listings. You can fire. Um, right. you, you can filter it out. So you can look for both. Although it doesn't syndicate with MLSs currently, um, which MLS means listed. Those are the same things. It's listed on an MLS is when it's listed. Um, that syndication isn't um, current, right? There's many. There's thousands of them across the United States. So that's a huge undertaking. Um, but even so, sometimes you're going to see some properties that say they're not listed but they're actually listed because that's hard data to kind of pin down but by and large these properties are not listed if you have um that filter on that are asking for them not to be listed so yes many of these are are pre-listings um they're not necessarily pre-listings either though because a pre-listing would indicate that someone has spoken to an agent and has maybe signed a listing agreement and wants to sell that's not what this is this is just motivating factors Again, like we talked about a little bit earlier, they're in pre-foreclosure. Um, it's a probate property. Uh, it's vacant and there's an absentee owner, um, et cetera. Those are motivating factors indicating that someone might be more likely to sell, right? You as an investor, it's your responsibility to skip trace and pin, get their information, call them and ask if they want to sell, right? So that that's where it falls back on you. This just helps point you in the right direction. Pin does. That's fantastic. Well said. Um, yeah. All right, Charlie asked a question. Do you have to tell the real estate agent what you're going to use the property for if they ask? Because you're afraid if you do, they're gonna take advantage of that and try and acquire the property themselves. Charlie, again, they have a fiduciary and ethical responsibility. They have signed a contract with them. That is actually against the law. They can be prosecuted for that. Not only could they lose their license, but they would be facing legal action if they did that and somebody called them on the carpet. So please do not worry about that. What my advice to you would be is when you reach out to them, as a real estate agent, whether it's an on-market, of course, they've got a commission built in, or if it is potentially an off-market property, I would always let them know that you are willing to pay them a commission fee. At the end of the day, this is their business, this is their job, they want to make money. Money talks, as we That's all know. Right. So my advice to you is just let them know they're going to get paid, you have every intent. Again, if this is especially an off-market property, just let them know right out the gate that you intend to pay them their commission um, or their fee or whatever you know it potentially is on that property. But if they have signed an agreement with that client, they are um, legally bound to that contract um, and they would be, for easier words, in big trouble if they if they basically broke that contract and pursued that property um, personally. Well said. What I like this one, um, which is just really broad. Can you go over micro flip? I don't understand it. Sure. So micro flip is um, connected investors word for wholesaling. You're going to hear wholesaling uh, much more frequently. So if you're speaking to other people about it, it's called, it's called wholesaling. Um, wholesaling is putting a property under contract. So if I find um, Dana wants to sell me a property, it's uh, vacant. She's been paying um, money on it for years. The roof is falling in and she's ready to get rid of it, right? I'm gonna call Dana. I found Dana from calling through the pin list. Unbelievable. Actually, I mailed her because we prefer mailing. So she called me and we're talking about her vacant property that she wants to sell, right? So I'm the wholesaler, I'm talking to Dana. I'm gonna put her contract, you know, Dana says, I'm ready to get rid of it. I'm gonna sell it to you for $50,000. And I say, that's fantastic. I wanna buy it for $50,000. We put it under contract, a purchase and sale contract. Personally, I use purchase and sale contracts that are um, from the MLS. So whatever the local MLS is, those are the contracts I deal with. But PIN has an amazing ability, a contract genie, which is a plugin that you can get. So you can just use a very simple purchase and sale contract to get you started, okay? So I'm gonna put that contract out. We signed it, Dana and I sign it. Now, Jenny, who's our favorite fix and flipper at Investment Angels and with P, uh, with PIN, she is really interested for it, uh, in this property for $75,000, right? So Dana's a seller. I've gone, I've mailed, I've spent money, I've sourced this property, which is a really great deal. And I've sourced it for 50, right? That's my contract. But Jenny wants it for 75. And so it's still a great deal for Jenny because Jenny's gonna put 50 into it and she's gonna sell it for 250. So she's making great money. 
the seller's happy because they're getting rid of this, this dump, right? And I'm providing a service. So I'm going to sell it to Jenny for $75,000. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually execute an assignment contract. So my contract with Dana, I'm assigning the rights to that underlying contract to a third party, Jenny. You can also double close, but this is a beginner. So we're going to yeah. So we assigned it to Jenny and Jenny is actually going to close on it for $75,000. Um, and Dane is going to get $50,000. So that differential, that $25,000 difference between what Jenny's willing to pay for it and what Dane is willing to sell it to me for is coming to me. So it's going on a settlement statement, just kind of like a commission, if you're familiar with settlement statements or so commissions come out as a line item on a settlement statement, there's your $25,000. You go home to the bank with that. You don't sign any paperwork. Um, it's over. And again, you can find a purchase and sale contract executed with Dana and an assignment contract executed with Jenny in contract to me to get you started. Um, and you can also find a bunch of training videos besides that wonderful um, synopsis I just gave you. And you need a little dust up after this. Reach out to us, obviously. We're here for you. But you can also go on Connected Investors. They have tons of uh, videos and help and training. It's, it's awesome. It's a great way to get started. And, and can I just add one little bit because you did a great job with that. And the term micro flipping was introduced in PIN because of the time it takes now with finding the property, locking it up with the owner, and then being able to then assign it to an end buyer. So it's the time it takes. We have um, PIN has allowed you to cut that time in half. Yep, that that's was great. great. Awesome. Yep. Billy's got a question on MLS offers. Can I buy using my trust instead of my LLC? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yes. yes. So it really doesn't matter what sort of business structure you are. If you're a trust, if you're an LLC, if you're an S corp, if you're a C corp, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's just what really, whatever the purchasing entity is going to be, especially if you're doing any sort of creative finance, like um, a subject to type agreement, more likely than not, it will typically be in what's called a trust agreement. Um, I highly advise you dust up on um, all of that information. If you don't know, the three of us are extremely familiar with creative finance options um, and how to embark upon those. Um, but yeah, Billy, um, you can absolutely buy it in any form of um, company structure for that. And then one more quick, easy so question. What's the agent? Oh, sorry, no. go ahead. I was just, Tony has kind of a, a longer one. So do you, yes. do you want to um, answer about oh. the agent one and then we'll go yes. over Tony's? Clifford asks, what's the agent fee? So agent fee typically across the U.S. is a total of 6%. That can also be negotiated. So for those of you that aren't familiar and haven't bought a lot of real estate, please know that the typical spread is 3% for the listing agent, so from the seller side, and then 3% for the buyer's agent. The seller pays the entire amount. So whatever they agreed upon, whether it was four, five, six percent, um, that is coming out of the seller's pocket. But again, typically at 6%, that can also be negotiated. So keep that in mind. If you're wanting to list a property, you better barter and negotiate the heck out of that puppy with your real estate agent. Especially because there's tons of lawsuits right now. So, so you're good. <laughs> Realtors are in a lot of trouble. Um, so this is a really good one. Though. I think it's a, it sounds like maybe, maybe a real world um, example. My virtual assistant found me a motivated seller. The seller wants 50000 asking price. The house looks to be in poor condition from what I've seen from the outside in a very poor neighborhood. Should I make an offer considering where the house is located? Do I make an offer or not? I found three comps. One comp sold recently for 25,000. Comp two sold for 60,000. Comp three sold for 54,000. The comps for 25 and 60 are a bit closer in proximity. I feel like I am in school and I'm reading a test question. <laughs> but that's good. I love test questions. That was a great question though. It's a great question. And I think this is a really good misconception. I've actually heard this brought up a lot. It's a poor neighborhood. So don't let your own biases and standards right. affect your ability to make informed real estate decisions, right? Just because a neighborhood is, is poor in your estimation doesn't mean it's not a good property. It just means you need to look at the hard numbers there and decide what the exit strategy is, right? If it's a property you're trying to uh, rent, 
you might find it hard to rent for a high value or you might have um, issues with tenants there, et cetera. So it's something to take into consideration if it's a buy and hold. If it's a wholesale deal, you're just looking at the numbers. You're just breaking it down. So is the $60,000 a fully renovated property? Are they renovating properties in that neighborhood yet? Or would you be trying to sell the first ever renovated house, right? It sounds like based on your comps, they're asking the market value or above market value for property. Um, or for that property at 50,000, if your other cap is at 60,000. Um, so you would need that for much, much cheaper just from the outset. So that's my take on it. I'd love to hear Jenny and Dana's take on that. So, I love that. Um, stuff. Yeah. Go ahead, Jen. I was just going to say, honestly, I am not opposed, and I know this is my, maybe a negative connotation or derogatory term. I'm not opposed to being a slumlord. Um, everybody needs a place to live. I don't care what community, what the economy looks like. So for me, my husband and I, really, as long as there's cash flowing potential for us, I don't care. I don't ever get emotionally attached to my investment properties. At the end of the day, it is a business transaction. And again, I don't care who I rent to. I could care less what their status is. As long as they're making their payments, they're making their payments on time. Um, so... I don't know, I, I, I don't ever over question a property or a neighborhood or a community. I will approach that, that particular property and I will decide what exit strategy makes the most sense. Where am I going to make the highest ROI, return on my investment? Whether it ends up being a fix and flip, sweet. Maybe it ends up being a buy and hold property down the road, right? Even if it was a $50,000 property, my initial investment is extremely low. Good grief. If you can basically rent a $50,000 property for $500, you are cash flowing on that property. It might only be 100 bucks a month, but you are even at interest rates today. So you're going to want to analyze every property independently and then decide what your ultimate exit strategy is on that property. That's how I approach it. I love that. And I couldn't agree more with Steph and Jenny. Um, don't let your own personal biases get in the way. Uh, poor people need a place to live too. And oh, if wait. they're living and working in those areas, they need good housing. And so what better way to then become a part of bringing value back to that community? Uh, when I first started, uh, I wholesaled three houses in one of the poorest areas in North Carolina. Everyone thought I was crazy. Oh, stay away from that area. I made ten thousand uh, dollars. My first deal, and so and I helped out three families by selling it to an end buyer who brought back value to that community. And so you are not only, you know, making money for yourself, but you're helping out a community as well. And so like, and also what Jenny said, it, let the deal dictate the strategy. Is this going to be good as a buy and hold or a fix and flip? Will you be, and what Stephanie said as well, um, you being the first one to rehab something in that community. And so overall, um, don't look at the, you know, just the areas itself. Look at the house, look at the numbers, and let that be the determining factor. I like also, it. Also, here's a little easy one that's been asked a couple times by Joan, and that is the uh, question about the proof of funds. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. And realtors will ask you, savvy realtors, not all realtors, just savvy ones, will ask you for proof of funds. Um, <laughs> We work with a lot of non-savvy ones. Um, and so the proof of funds is what we use personally is a line of credit, actually. So we have a line of credit um, and that line of credit is approved for a couple million dollars. Um, it's a revolving line of credit. And I send that. It's not actually cash. It actually does require an appraisal. Um, but for all intents and purposes, it works. It's hard money. It's fast. We don't put it in a, um, a financing contingency in our offers. So they operate like cash offers. Um, so where you can get one is going to a lender, right? You can go to privatelenders.com. Um, you can go to a myriad of different sources. Come to us at the investmentangels.com. Come reach out to these different sources and then get pre-approved, right? So you'll get pre-approved for a certain amount. And then that can serve as your proof of funds when they ask. And, and remember to be savvy when they talk to you about these things. You are offering a, uh, a 
basically uh, a financing freeze that you don't have a financing contingency in your offer, which makes it akin to cash. That's what a cash offer is. It means that you can't get out if you can't get financing. So if you're wholesaling, um, that is what you can tell them because that's the kind of offer that you'd be submitting and go grab that proof of funds from one of the lenders that you work with um, and start that relationship with that person too, with that lender. So that'll solve your problem. Yeah, no, that's, right. that's great. Billy, you asked kind of a complex question. If I get an off-market deal under contract with power of attorney and a right to market it, can I as the investor listed on the MLS? The answer to that is actually no. Even if you do have a real estate license, that is a major conflict of interest. So you absolutely cannot do that. That is a double standard and that will not fly. If you technically- I don't know. That's a huge practice, Jenny. I don't know. Yeah. Like, typically, I don't, you can represent yourself as an no owner vacant. agent, but yeah. he's not the owner. He is only POA. He's a power of attorney. He is not the owner agent. When I buy properties and I list them, I'm owner agent. I don't know. This one's a tricky one. I think it's a fine line. From my point of view, I don't. I don't think that's legal or ethical. I know that you can, people do it all the time, though, and there's different. And you can sign addendums, um, and you can put it into your contract. So legally. You can do it. It's it's a kind of it's not, I wouldn't say common practice, but it is it is definitely practiced frequently by major wholesalers that are doing direct to seller deals. It's all all what it boils down to is what's in your contract. What did someone sign? What did they agree to do? And that's what you can do. So you need to be speaking with an attorney, and your uh, your yes. contract needs to be airtight. So they it needs that's to be airtight, and if you list it, then it's going to have to probably be you know, you're going to have to disclose, et cetera. So it's going to be twofold. Speak with your attorney as to what the seller is allowing you to do and then see what your local MLS regulations are because those vary wildly from state to state, from municipality to municipality and from MLS to MLS. And I was just going to so add a little conflicting. to what Steph said. Um, anytime you're uncertain, consult with an attorney. Please consult with an attorney. If you have an inkling as to it not being the right thing to do, consult with an attorney. Love it. Yep, absolutely. I know we're butting up right against nine o'clock. We've, we've pretty yes. much taken an hour. This has actually been a really fun, a very different way to host um, our session tonight. Our apologies for not having this be a formal presentation. We don't have the amazing Craig Carlton uh, representing yeah. um, you, Craig. We do, we do miss you, but this has been fun and great more direct questions. This was all about you guys tonight as potential investors, as experienced investors. So it's been fun to answer these questions. It's been yeah. great. We all have a different approach that we bring to the table. Um, that's why connected investors is so amazing, right? We can all connect. We can all help each other. Um, it's just a big, huge support system. So with that. And what's that thing you always say, Jen? Together we can what? It's like the Nike thing, right? Go We're further, bigger, right? better, stronger, better together. That's like, true. it's just, it's the truth. It's the fact of the matter. So um, with that, that, we encourage you, if you're not members of PIN, go subscribe. I believe it's Connected Investors, Backsplash, <laughs> the Hell's PIN. I should know this information, but I don't. But you guys have access to Connected Investors, so I encourage you to go subscribe. The data in there is fantastic. There are so many different motivated leads that we touched on fairly heavily tonight. Um, so we encourage you to do that. Um, and if you've got any further questions, you know the three of us are here at your disposal to, you know, to reach out to. So please do that as well. Um, with that, any any parting words, ladies? No, I think this was great. Thank you all for being here. You could have been anywhere tonight, but you chose to spend this time with us, and we're grateful for that. And we hope to for you all to connect with us. Please connect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And we hope we were able to answer some of your really great questions. Thank you for putting the thought behind those. And yeah, we hope to see you on PIN. Hopefully I get some, you know, pluses or red, you know, alerts that everyone's friending us and we can continue to explore PIN together. Love it. Awesome, guys. Well, thank, thank you so you much. Ladies. This was wonderful. Thank you so thank much. You. Of course. Have a good yeah, night, absolutely. everyone. All righty. Good night.